I was thinking about that uh, remodeling project that, that God's got going on in our lives that uh, Kurt shared from uh, shared uh, from the Daily Bread about, and that is a lifelong remodeling process by God's Spirit at work in our hearts and our lives each and every day. Sometimes. Uh, Anyway, it is a lifelong project. Uh, so the scriptures I'm going to read today are actually from what we call the lectionary. These are the scripture readings that are read by many churches throughout the world this day. But I looked at these and I thought they provide us with some godly wisdom for this remodeling project that Kurt was talking about, for God to work within our hearts, within our lives by his spirit. So, uh, first from Psalm chapter 1, and this particular psalm is called Wisdom Literature, like Proverbs is called Wisdom Literature, God's Wisdom for Our Lives. So, the psalmist writes this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And I will stop there, but think about what the psalmist says. Blessed is the person who does not walk according to the counsel of the wicked, but instead takes delight in God's law and meditates on it day and night. That person will be like a tree planted by streams of water, produce fruit. The leaves will not wither. Whatever that person does will prosper. So wisdom from Psalms. And from James's letter, again, wisdom for us to live by. He writes this, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. But God gives us more grace. That is why scriptures say God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. This is God's word and we give thanks. Let us pray. So gracious heavenly father, you have offered us insights into how we are to live our lives in scripture. We pray that we would 
hear your word and apply it to everything that we do. And we give thanks to you for your grace in Jesus Christ and pray in his name. Amen. So I'm going to begin with a little chorus, kind of to remind you of a chorus that you probably sang when you were children. And most of you probably remember this song from when you were kids. It, it begins, happy and you know it, clap your hands. Happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. You remember it. Okay. But the verse I want you to think about is this one. If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. If you're saved, then you know it, then your life will surely show it. If you're saved, then you know it, clap your hands. So think about that. If you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely show it. And that's what James's letter is all about. If you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely show it. As I picked up the scripture and looked at James's letter, I thought about the life of James. And think about James. James is believed by most scholars and biblical authorities to be the brother of Jesus Christ. Or at least the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And so I thought about what was it like to grow up in the same household as the Messiah? Son of God. John chapter 7, verse 5 says, even Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. However, we understand from the writings of scholar, from the writings of early first century, that the brothers of Jesus, even though they were initially skeptical, after the resurrection, the brothers of Jesus came to put their faith and trust. In Jesus as their Messiah as well. And James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And James ended up ultimately writing this letter to Christians that were dispersed all over Asia Minor. There was a result of persecution in the Roman Empire. So again, think about what it was like to grow up in the household of Jesus as one of his siblings, one of his brothers. I thought about how his brothers growing up probably resented him. They probably thought of Jesus as a goody-goody. They probably thought, uh, Jesus, he always obeys mom and dad. He always eats his vegetables. He always cleans his room. He's a good guy. And they were jealous and they were envious. So I thought about that uh, just a couple weeks ago as I was reflecting on James. Uh, my granddaughters were visiting Labor Day weekend, and they watched a remake of Cinderella. And you know the story of Cinderella. Cinderella was a woman of character. She was kind. She was compassionate. She was caring. She was a humble servant, very loyal, very faithful, very kind. And her two stepsisters were jealous. They were envious. They were selfish. They were self-centered. They demanded their own way. They wanted what they wanted, and they, they were just rotten people. And I thought about this contrast, and I thought about James's, James and his brothers growing up in that household with Jesus and being envious and angry and jealous of this man, Jesus. And later, when they came to put their faith in him, James remembered the way Jesus treated them. He remembers how, in spite of how badly they may have treated him, Jesus still responded to them in kindness and compassion and caring and gentleness and love. You think about Jesus' statement that we need to love our enemies and pray for them. 
does. So here James, in his letter, writes a letter about how we should live our lives as God's children. Probably thinking about Jesus and what he learned from Jesus as his brother growing up in that household. James's letter is very practical about how we're to live our lives as Christians. In fact, my study Bible says if you're looking for good practical guidance on Christian living, you've come to the right book when you read James. You know, James is the one that talks about taming the tongue. James is the one that says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Here, James, in this letter, talks about two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom that we get from the world, from society, from the world around us, and the wisdom that we get from heaven. Remember, James is writing to Christians that have been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, and Roman, the pagan Romans, are looking at their lives. The pagan Romans, who worship Caesar as Lord, pagan Romans, whose lives are all about personal pleasure and self-indulgence, worshiping the gods of pleasure and self-indulgence, pagan Romans are looking at the lives of these Christians with curiosity. They're saying these people worship a different Lord. They don't worship Caesar. They worship Jesus as Lord. Are their lives going to be any different? Are they going to, what do their lives look like? How are they living their lives? And obviously, James here is writing to believers. He's writing to people whom Jesus has called to be the light of the world, whom Paul says are to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And obviously there's some tension and discord going on. And, he, and uh, James writes about these two kinds of wisdom. And what kind of wisdom are we living by? Are we living by the earth's wisdom? Where do we find our truth? Where do we find our values? Where do we find how we're to live our lives for Jesus? And James talks about that here. Perhaps reflecting a little bit on Psalm 1. Remember Psalm 1, I said, is the word. What does the Psalm say? Blessed is the person. And blessed is kind of like the beatitude. Blessed. Beatitudes. Blessed. To be blessed means to be at peace. It needs to be content. It needs to be happy. It needs to be satisfied with your life. But blessed, if you don't walk according to the world's wisdom, the counsel of the wicked, stand in the seat of, or sit in the seat of mockers, stand in the way of the sinners, you're blessed if you don't follow the world's wisdom, but you're blessed if you delight in God's law, if you delight in God's word and you meditate on it day and night, then you will build a firm foundation for your life. Meditate on the word of God. You delight in the word of God. You put it into practice. So I think about what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus taught us, gave us a lot of God's values and principles. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said this. If you listen to what I have to say, you will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And when the storms of life came, when the trials came, when the COVID comes, when the world seems to be falling apart, that house stood firm. We need a firm foundation. We need a rock to build our house upon. And Jesus Christ gives us that foundation. So again, as the psalmist said, the person who delights in the word of the Lord and meditates on it day and night is going to be like a tree planted by streams of water. That tree is going to be strong. The leaves will not wither and that tree will produce fruit. So perhaps James is reflecting a little bit on that when he says to all those who are wise and understanding, show it by living a good life. And what is a good life? look like. I call my message living the good life. 
living the good life, says John Ortberg, is living the God life, living a life that is lived in the wisdom and knowledge and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So he says there's two kinds of wisdom. What do these two kinds of wisdom look like? Wisdom that is earthly, he says, is characterized by envy and selfish ambition. Now think about that. Some of us at times in our own lives have struggled with envy and selfish ambition. And he says, whenever you find envy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder in every form of evil. Again, think about that. Look around us in our society that's today. Wherever you find envy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder in every form of evil. Perhaps I know in my own life when I have been dealing with my own selfish ambition, when I've dealt, been wrapped up with self-interest and selfishness, I have found that my life was filled with disorder. It's not a good thing. It's not a good way to live. That's not the way God wants us to live. He says that is wisdom from earth. That is wisdom that's derived from the world around us. And we think about where do we get our truth? Where do we get our values? And it's so hard. We live, even though we say we follow Jesus Christ, Christ is our Lord, Christ is our Savior. We tend to listen to all the inputs that we receive from the world around us. So we look at media and we say, that's something I want. We look at advertising, that's something I want, I need to have. And we sometimes get distracted by the world around us. James says that is earthly wisdom when it produces envy and self-centeredness, selfish ambition. But he says wisdom that is from heaven is first of all pure. It leads to living lives of integrity. It is peace-loving. It is considerate. Consider it generous, gracious, kind toward others. It is humble. It is merciful, offering forgiveness and mercy to others. Being forgiving just as in Christ, God has forgiven us. Many, by saying, Peacemakers who sow in peace shall reap a harvest of righteousness. Jesus in the Beatitudes says, blessed are, are the peacemakers. Why? Because peacemakers shall be called the children of God. That is a characteristic, says Jesus, of God's people, God's children. So wisdom that is from heaven, says James, is far different from the wisdom that we find out in Wisdom that is from heaven is about humility. It's about being considerate toward others. It's about being merciful and gracious and kind. It's about being a peacemaker, seeking to understand rather than to force our perspective and understanding on everybody else, saying it's all about me. So he moves on further to the root of the problem. He says, where do quarrels and fights where does that come from as he writes to the people? Remember, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers, folks who are to be the light of the world, folks who are to be Christ's ambassadors. He says, where did this, was, does the fighting and the quarreling among you come from? He said, says it comes from your selfish desires that war within you. You want your own way. You want things the way you want them. It's got to be my way. I want this. I want that. And it's a challenge for us to kind of look at our lives from time to time, to time. When we get quarrelsome, when we get angry with other people, is it because I want my way? I know about, I know my own life. I get pretty self-centered. I want what I want. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. And he says, where does that come from? It comes from those self-centered desires, the war within our heart. But he gives us hope. At the end of this writing that we just read about, 
He says, but God offers us grace. God offers us grace and we need God's grace. Paul wrote, we were once dead in our transgression. We were once separated from God by our sin. But because of God's great love for each one of us, God who is rich in mercy has made us alive in Jesus Christ. It is by God's grace that we are saved. It is by grace that we are saved. Through faith, not by works, not by anything that we can do. It is by God's grace that we are saved. And Paul reminds, or excuse me, James reminds us of this right here, where he says, you know, we've got this self-centered nature. We've got envy. We've got selfish ambition and all of that. We need God's grace. We need God's mercy. We need God's help. There's nothing we can do to deserve God's gift. There's no way we can work for it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But God offers us his grace in Jesus Christ. For that we praise God because we are sinners just like everybody else. So he gives this final words of instruction for us to listen to, for us to put into practice in our own lives. He said, if you're going to resist the devil, if you're going to resist Satan's temptation to listen to the wisdom of the world, if you're going to do that, you need to submit yourselves to God. He gives us these two words of instruction. Submit yourself to God and draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Submit yourself to God. What does that look like? In Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse one, he says this in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, in view of what God has done for us, Sinners all. Offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Offer God your body, mind, and soul. Jesus, when he was asked about the greatest commandment in Mark chapter 12, he says, this is it. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your being. So James says this, if we're going to resist Satan's temptation to be like the rest of the world, if we're going to resist Satan's temptation to listen to the wisdom of the world, you've got to submit yourself to God. You've got to offer yourself to God first and foremost. God's got to be the priority of your life to glorify God in everything that you do. And secondly, he says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Each and every day. That's that uh, reconstruction project, the remodeling process within our lives. It takes drawing near to God each and every day. Delighting in his word, meditating on it day and night, letting the wisdom of heaven, God's wisdom, that he's revealed to us in Jesus Christ, the image, the visible image of the invisible God. Letting Christ's life and ministry and teachings, what Jesus had to teach us to shape our attitudes and our minds each and every day. We are called to show the world Jesus. We've got two kinds of wisdom going on. The wisdom of the world, God's wisdom. We are called to show the world Jesus. So I'll just conclude with a thought here, there's a book written by a man named David Kinneman, who is a, he's a researcher with the Barna Group. They do surveys and, and that sort of thing, polls and so forth, particularly religious polls. Well, he decided to interview thousands of non-church folk, folks who are outside the church, folks who don't want to be involved in the church. He interviewed thousands of these people. And what he found was that folks outside the church don't think church people are anything like Jesus. He said, we've got to change that re reputation. We've got to respond to others the way Jesus did. We've got to respond to others with service and sacrifice, with lives that are characterized by humility and by grace, we've got to show the world Jesus.
So think about what James says. And what this week, what I'd like to challenge you to do is to go back and read over what James has to say about earthly wisdom that's characterized by envy and selfish ambition, about God's wisdom that's been revealed in Jesus. That's about being considerate, merciful, peace, loving, and so forth. Go back and reflect on that. And then take James's instructions and put them into practice each day. Submit yourself to God. Ask God to help you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And draw near to God. Spend time delighting in his word, meditating on it, and letting it become the foundation for your attitude, for your thinking, for the way you live your life each and every day, and you will be blessed. Like that tree planted by streams of water that produces fruit day in and day out, that all that you do, says the psalmist, will prosper. Amen.